Hi, welcome back to another episode of Real World Serverless, a podcast where I speak with real world practitioners and get their stories from the trenches. Today, I'm joined by Uri from Lumigo. Hi, welcome to the show. Hey, Anne. Glad to be here. So we've been working together at Lumigo for a little while now. For the audience who are not familiar with uh, who Lumigo is, can you just quickly tell us uh, about Lumigo, what it does, and what is your role there? Sure. So uh, my name is Uri Parush, and uh, I'm a senior developer at uh, Lumigo. I have more than 10 uh, years experience in the industry as a developer, system architect, and so on. Um, And I joined Lumigo like more than a year ago. And uh, I'm really glad to tell you a bit about Lumigo. So what actually Lumigo does is uh, a serverless observability platform. And uh, what does it mean? So we actually give uh, troubleshooting uh, issues when you have for the serverless uh, platform, uh, stuff like uh, errors in Lambda and in your function, but with the full power of uh, flow context, uh, which you can actually see the business impact of those uh, issues. And I will elaborate a bit it a bit more later. Uh, we we also have a, a visibility. Uh, it's also visibility tools uh, of all the moving parts of your serverless system. Uh, this means it's not just about Lambda. You have many other services, probably like F3, Kinesis, DynamoDB, Firewalls, and so on. And uh, we put them all in the same place and show you the full visibility of all your flow using them. Uh, another great thing about Lumigo is predefined alerts. You get uh, the right focus on your issues uh, with specific alerts which are predefined by Lumigo, and uh, we use our experience to give you the best insights we can do. And uh, one more thing about uh, Lumigo that it also consolidates all your serverless application data. And what is this data? Um, I'm talking about logs, uh, trace data, and uh, metrics. And we actually put all of those, all of this data in a single source of truth, uh, which is usually a hard work for uh, each customer uh, need to do. And uh, we do it for you. So uh, Lumigo was an interesting journey from, of Lumigo product was when I started to work with Lumigo. Uh, the main focus of Lumigo was the operational team. Uh, a real focus was to help the operation team with the day-to-day work to keep a healthy production. Uh, but as time passed by, uh, we started to see more and more customers using Lumigo, not just for the production environment, but for all their environments, which include the developer personal account, the CI CD environment, staging environment, and so on. Uh, so today, uh, we have customers using Lumigo all over their product uh, development lifecycle, which is amazing. Uh, and of course, in Lumigo, we do the same uh, for our uh, environment. So Lumigo is not just a production tool, it's a full product life cycle tool. Okay, so with Lumigo ingesting a lot a lot of this information from the customers, uh, so you must be taking in a lot of data because every time I invoke my function, you're gonna get some data coming into your system. So how does, uh, well, I guess, what does the Lumigo's architecture look like from say 30,000 uh, feet view? So in general, uh, our system, as many uh, other systems out there, is a data streaming, data processing system, uh, which results in useful insight for our customers. Uh, we collect data from multiple sources like uh, Trace, uh, Trace Lambda. Uh, we use a lightweight agent, uh, which we custom made for uh, Lambda, invo- uh, Lambda services. And we also collect uh, customers' logs and uh, AWS services metrics. Uh, with all three uh, sources, uh, the user gets the full context of the business flows in, in the system. Uh, for example, uh, let's let's take an example of API Gateway uh, Trigger Lambda, uh, which call a DynamoDB. Uh, with Omega, uh, you get a clear view of the, the flow alongside with the relevant context. And what do I mean by saying context? Uh, let's say, the API gateway uh, triggered the Lambda. And uh, what you will see in Lumigo is also the uh, event which was triggered, which uh, include the path, the query param, the header, everything you need to know about the event that triggered the Lambda. Uh, you get the Lambda execution data, which includes also the errors, the return value, environment parameters, and so on. And you also get the query for the DynamoDB, for example, the table name, the context of the query, the data of the query, and so on. 
So you get the full context. So uh, our architecture is based purely on uh, serverless and all our infrastructure using only serverless technology. We don't have any VM or physical uh, uh, machine. And uh, we use multiple services of AWS like Kinesis, F3, Firebase, Lambda, and WDB, API Gateway, and the list goes on. And we always uh, using more and more uh, new services of AWS, uh, and it's worked really good for us. So we usually use Kinesis Firebase to stream the data. Uh, we use DynamoDB to store the data, and we use Lambda to process the data. This is our core services in, the, in our infrastructure. Okay, so as a customer that uses uh, Lumigo, one of the criteria that you know, that's important to consider for me is the, how much overhead is uh, the Lumigo collection agent or the, whole, or the whole process is adding to my function's invocation time. Um, have you guys done any work to minimize the sort of the, the I guess the latency for your collection API so that uh, uh, for example if you, you know if you you say your service is all serverless uh, I imagine you're gonna have API gateway and lambda uh, but lambda has got a cold start and it's not acceptable for me to you know finish my invocation to send you the data but then you have a cold start on your end so are you doing anything on the server side on the backend side of things to optimize that latency, maybe moving the collection API to um, containers, perhaps? So actually, that's true. Uh, when we started uh, developing the Lumigo product, uh, we used API Gateway, and uh, we found it uh, a bit problematic for our customer the, because we had latency issues. So the R agent is uh, very lightweight, and to keep it lightweight, uh, we did some changes in, in our uh, infrastructure, and we moved to using uh, containers and Fargate uh, we use NGX to uh, to process our uh, trace data. Uh, so our latency is really low now. We're talking about a few milliseconds to tens of milliseconds. It really depends on your uh, Lambda configuration. And, uh, and, and this is how we solve uh, this issue for our customer, which is uh, very important to our customer. Latency is a huge core uh, idea in Lumigo. We don't want to impact uh, the customer environment at all so it's very lightweight yeah that's great and uh, another thing that uh, I've, I've noticed because i've been also using lumigo myself in some of my client projects is that uh, you are scraping off some of the data uh, for example sometimes the the body or some of the, i noticed that some of the api keys are being scraped can you tell us a bit about uh, so some of the decision that led to that because that's something that i don't think any of the other platforms are doing but I think it's quite valuable, especially in a time where GDPR and data privacy has become more and more important thing. And one of the sort of blind sides that most of applications have is, uh, well, it's great that you know, we are you know, storing the user data in the in places where we can easily delete them if they ask us to. But we have also the same data being logged everywhere and it's gonna be a pain to try to get rid of those. Is that why you guys are doing all these data, data scraping so that you know, for GDPR compliance reasons, uh, that's one other thing that you don't have to think about? So Lumigo is very customer oriented and uh, this specific uh, request came from a customer which was very, uh, which security is a high value for his company. Is, a, is even a security company. So you have to know that our uh, product align with all his security policies. So it was actually from a customer. And uh, of course, we do the scraping uh, by default, uh, but we also have custom uh, fields that we can scrape, scrape from for every customer. So it's really uh, customized for all your uh, requests, for all the customer requests. Uh, but yes, it, it was a request from a customer and uh, GDPR and any other certificate that you have, we are uh, want to, to know that we are not uh, damaging them. Okay, that's great. I guess the, one of the flip side of that is uh, sometimes I do want to see the, you know, the body and that they are scraped off uh, by default. Um, but I guess uh, that's kind of the the trade-off you're making here. Uh, so you're saying that you, it's possible for me to say, um, you know, ask you to not scrape the HTTP body for some operations, but you can configure that differently for per customer, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, usually what we do is that we always uh, keep uh, uh, 
a hook that uh, we can use some environment variables that can be customized for each customer. So we can have a customized environment for each of our customers with their specific need that, uh, for his uh, environment. Okay, that's useful. That's good to know. Uh, I'll probably have to do something with you guys <laughs> so that uh, I, can, I can get some of my uh, HP bodies uh, in my um, Lumigo view. Um, so in this case, uh, you are ingesting a huge amount of data from all these different customers. Tell us about the sort of, I guess, your architecture for ingestion. And uh, did you learn anything when you were uh, iterating on this architecture around cost and performance? Because again, with serverless, it's great when you are you know, running at a low scale. But as your scale goes up, your cost can also get you know, quite expensive as well. Are you guys you know, doing anything clever to optimize on the cost and performance? So actually, I had a nice uh, journey on, on the cost issue. Uh, at first, when I joined Lumigo, uh, I never, I never developed a serverless, full serverless application before. And what I noticed here that uh, I was, I need to have a, a shift in my mind. Uh, for for cost is very important in the serverless world because usually, I, usually I was focused before on, on performance, but cost was a side issue. It usually is not a developer responsibility. It was more. Uh, and architectural, the, the VPRMD or architecture was this, this decision. And, uh, and now each developer has huge impact on the cost. Uh, and one of the things we notice in Lumigo that uh, we use Kinesis uh, to stream all of data. And uh, in some places, uh, Kinesis become very uh, expensive for us. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, we couldn't do over provision uh, in Kinesis for free. Uh, you, you are paying per shard in Kinesis, and we actually need to do some over provisioning to be prepared for large, large amount of data, and uh, the data is consistency, and you never know when you're going to go into peaks. So it's became more and more expensive for us to use the Kinesis in some parts of our system. So what we did is do some cost analysis to and compare between Kinesis and Firehose. And uh, we found Firehose a, a nice solution, a nice alternative. Uh, for some of our uh, flows. And uh, we actually switch between Kinesis and Firewalls. Uh, uh, the big advantage is Firewalls can have uh, over provision for free. Uh, you do have some, uh, it's, it's not streaming like uh, Kinesis. So you have some latencies uh, issues if you, if you use it all over your system. But in some parts of the system, the latency was not an issue. So we did the changer and it saved us a lot of money. And I guess uh, Firehose has got a default throughput limit as well, right? If I remember correctly, it's like 10,000 records per second. Did you also have to ask AWS to raise that? Is that what you mean by uh, over provision? Yeah, exactly. So uh, till now, our AWS were very gentle with us and uh, give us all our requests. So yeah, I, I did a, a request for AWS and we did an over provision of 10 times our traffic and uh, it was all good and now we are prepared for much more and it doesn't cost us anything so this was a big advantage for firewalls for us in the, in this use case yeah that whole thing about the managing shards uh, that's really annoying with uh, kinesis and i do see uh, the, the appeal for uh, firehose in this particular regard um, because it's all paid by usage and you only pay for data that gets transferred uh, rather than paying for uptime for the shards and the annoying thing also is that with Kinesis, there's no, uh, there's no built-in auto scaling. You end up having to build your own auto scaling as well. I've done that like three, dif three different times. Um, and even though they've got an API that you can call to change the shard number, there's no trigger for you to actually do your. You no, know, you have to do the whole thing yourself or use the application auto scaling mechanism, which is also not well documented for custom uh, scaling behaviors like this either. Uh, but yeah, so I do see the, the appeal for you know, why you guys went to that approach. Um, so another thing that I think we talked about before in terms of uh, what you've been doing to optimize for performance uh, is uh, you had to switch to a multi-region uh, approach to improve the ingestion latency. Do you remember how much of a difference did that make? Uh, was it you know, a case of uh, a few milliseconds or was it tens of milliseconds? Any ideas of what sort of benefit uh, you were able to derive from going multi-region? So it, it was a it was a big change, and uh, it was it has a, a big impact on the latency. And we do it for uh, and we do it for two reasons. One reason is really the latency, 
And the second one is, uh, is the cost. Uh, because communication between uh, region, the same region is, is much cheaper than cross region. So we do it also for, not just for our trace data, for also for our logs data and metrics data. So we actually collect your, uh, your, all, your, all your customer data from a specific region, which, which is for, uh, for we, we are not using cross region, we are using the same region for every uh, collection. So the impact uh, time web is was like 10% of, uh, of impact. It was more than a few milliseconds. It was like tens to hundreds of milliseconds difference. Okay. Did you also look at any other options uh, like a global accelerator, um, which I, when I looked at it, is quite expensive, but it's also meant to be really good in terms of uh, you know, making sure that the, the, the latency is really good. Doesn't matter where you are trying to access the endpoints from. So actually, we are we are kind of start looking at it now uh, because we have a solid uh, uh, we are in a solid place which our latency is, is uh, pretty low and we we don't have to improve it anymore to get our customers satisfied. But we are looking for uh, for the future. Yeah, we, we might look at the other solution and uh, improve it even more. But we are currently have a, a very solid solution. Okay, that's great. And uh, one other thing that I remember we talked about before was uh, that I think Lumigo is doing it, which is uh, which I think is uh, quite fun. Uh, is uh, you are using Lumigo to monitor Lumigo itself. Uh, so what were some of the insights that you that you, you know you got from this? Uh, surely you, you know you probably experience a lot of the same pain points that your customers do as well in terms of uh, how difficult it is to troubleshoot a serverless application. Um, how do you guys you know, help identify problems for your customers? So actually, this is a really interesting question. I think this is one of the best things about working in Lumigo is that you also used to be uh, also a customer of Lumigo. And uh, this, this gives us a, a really special view on, on serverless uh, development. And uh, it actually means that every de developer in Lumigo have a huge impact on the product design. Uh, a lot of the ideas that uh, that we are uh, implementing the Lumigo platform are coming internally from Lumigo developers, uh, which is great. So it's I'm talking about stuff like which data is really important, which uh, graph is uh, is useful for us. Like, uh, do I need all the graphs as AWS? Do I need other graph? Do I need to correlate? Uh, which data need to be correlated together, which give you the best view, like which logs are important, uh, which views, views of timeline, views of, views of graph, of flows, uh, and many of the ideas uh, coming uh, internally. Uh, also, we have uh, specific alerts that, uh, that we invented in Lumigo that uh, we know help us to, to get over some uh, difficult, like, uh, do I have a Lambda that's, stop triggering and uh, it could it could see like a, a, an issue it could be an issue it's it's not an error but it could be an issue for my system usually a, a lambda triggered uh, every day and now it stopped so those special alerts are, are really uh, internally designed in lumigo and uh, what what it does is that we because we have a huge uh, serverless uh, platform we many times see problems that our customers are not facing yet uh, and it saves our customer a lot of time that we, we see it in Lumigo, we develop the product to support them, and then we see other customers using the same uh, capabilities that we develop. So it's kind of amazing uh, that, that we always improving our product with our own insights. Yeah, I think that's one of the really interesting things that Lumigo is doing. I'm not sure if the other vendors are doing that, but definitely I think it's a, it's a really good practice to be dog fooding yourself. And I think um, Netflix used to talk about this uh, quite, was, was it Netflix or Amazon? They used to talk about this uh, practice of uh, you know, dog fooding yourself uh, uh, quite a while back as well. Um, so you've, you've joined Lumigo for a few years now, and you said this is the sort of first time you've had to work on a fully serverless architecture. What are some of the challenges that you have experienced as you transition to this different way of building things, you know, this whole fully serverless or at least serverless first uh, approach to building systems? So it was an interesting question because when I first joined Lumigo and uh, I, I look at, at uh, serverless architecture and it really changed my point of view on 
how you should develop uh, a, a, des a design a, a product, a system. Uh, so we actually, as I said before, I, I was more focused most of the time about uh, code quality and uh, performance issues and stuff like that. And cost was a big change for me because I never had such a huge responsibility on the cost. And uh, I think I think this changed not just the the mindset of a developer, but it changed the whole organization. So maybe the budget need to be more close to the developer now because he's more responsible for this and stuff like that. So it really changed the, the point of view of, uh, of things in, in, in your organization. And, uh, and, and so this is, this is my two cents about, uh, about serverless uh, uh, development. So you, you have to be prepared to, to, um, to change your, your thought. Don't, you have to become open to serverless uh, uh, system because it really changed the way you build things. So it's, 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 it's amazing that you can infinity scale or close to infinity scale, but you have other responsibilities that come along with that. Uh, so this was a really big change for me. Yeah, that whole idea of uh, development and finance being, I guess, quite inter interlinked, uh, that's something that uh, Simon Wilder has talked about a lot. Uh, this whole idea of a FinDev or finance, where finance and, and development kind of work together because uh, performance optimization has a really tangible and measurable cost optimization as well. And this whole idea of FinDev is something that uh, me, actually I did a, uh, a podcast recently with uh, Alexander uh, and uh, Slobo down who are also AWS Service Series as well. We pretty much did a whole episode on, you know, centered around FinDev. And there's also some really clever things you can do when it comes to FinDev. For example, uh, you can you can work out the, the return on investment on features and bugs and see, okay, where should you optimize in terms of, what well, where should you prioritize work because if a bug is maybe annoying, but you may, you may think it's quite important, but when you look at the, the actual cost of that bug, it may just be a few dollars, and uh, you, you, know, you may decide, okay, it's not worth optimizing at all. Or you look at a Lambda function, it's inefficient, but you know, you're gonna spend a month optimizing something that can only save you up to, what, $10 a month. Uh, again, just not worth the engineering time you're gonna spend into it because engineering time is also a cost as well. And then there's also, you know, at times like this, especially with COVID-19 and the financial impact it's had, well, the economic impact it's had globally, this idea of FinDev can also be applied as a business advantage whereby, you know, we get pay as you go from AWS and we can build products that are also charged on a variable basis based on how much you use the platform rather than always gonna be a fixed fee so that most customers end up can save end up saving a lot of money. And especially at times like this where there's so much uncertainty economically, I think that's also gonna be a more and more common thing we're gonna see in terms of uh, products and services coming out that are built using serverless as well. I, d I definitely think that's uh, that's in one area which probably not quite explored as, you know, as much as I would like to see, but I definitely think it's something that's uh, it's going to be much bigger going forward. Um, so, in terms of uh, other things that uh, you know AWS can do better, are there any platform limitations that you have run into that's made your life difficult? Yes. Yeah, so, actually, uh, I talked about it before. So, I really, really want to see a uh, Kinesis uh, really to just pay as a usage uh, uh, because in our system currently is one of the more expensive uh, components. And uh, I really want to see. Uh, I don't want to pay for idle Kinesis. This is my uh, this is my pain in Kinesis. Uh, we're not using it. I'm still paying for it. So I really want to see improvement in this area. Uh, the second one is the is log group uh, multi subscription. Uh, one other thing I can say about uh, logs that usually you have more than one system that uh, need to go over your logs. It could be a security system. It could be a a visibility system or visibility system like ours. It could be other internal systems. And having just one subscription really limit uh, uh, your usage with logs. So I think this is a every step forward to have multiple uh, subscription. And also one uh, pain pain point that I that I discovered in uh, AWS is uh, the auto scaling of DynamoDB. Uh, I, f I figured that it, it's a bit slow. Uh, so it's it's force your system because because you have slow auto scaling and you get throttle 
uh, for some time. Uh, I'm talking about minutes here, but but still in in our line of uh, work, which is we are working streamings and uh, in real time, a few minutes is kind of a lot. So uh, what we have to do is to do some back pressure and wait for the auto scaling to kick in. But but I I want to see uh, auto scaling work much much faster. Uh, that these are three things that I really want to see improve in uh, in, in the AWS, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure they're all under. Uh, I'm sure we will see them in the future. So you know that the multiple subscription filter thing. Uh, apparently, as this is true, uh, is uh, is already available today. But you have to raise a support ticket. It's not it's not a service limit raise. It's a support ticket and say please enable it on my account. And it's a, and it's a, and they can be enabled on the whole account, not on specific log groups. It's uh, it's almost like a secret they didn't they haven't talked about. But I only found out because I was I just happened to be talking to somebody uh, and they, and from AWS and they and they told me that that's the thing. You can raise a support ticket and ask for it. Uh, which is just, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's crazy that they don't make that a thing that you can just turn on in the console. Uh, but yeah, there you go. That's one uh, off the list. <laughs> um, and on the auto scheme. Yeah. Okay, go on. Yeah, just, just about the, if you're talking about low group subscription, we are doing an auto subscription for our customer to, to collect their logs. So it's not really reasonable that we open a ticket for each customer we have. So it's not internal problem of ours. It's for our, all of our customers. So it's it's really problematic. And I, I totally agree with you. It should be default. It should be very easy to do it. Uh, I, I'm not sure why it's not like that, but I'm sure it's going to be. Yes, and uh, the other thing you mentioned, the auto scaling for DynamoDB. Uh, I also ran into that uh, quite a few years ago. Or um, I think they've improved it a lot, uh, but it still doesn't auto scale fast enough. One of the things that one of the ways I found to work around it is the DynamoDB auto scaling is still uses the same auto application auto scaling mechanism, and it uh, when you enable it, it generates a cloud uh, watch alarm. So what you can do is that you can hijack that, and you can change the the alarms uh, because it uses like I think five um, you checks for five minutes. So what you can do is that you can change the alarm configuration to say one minute, so that you can improve the auto scaling to kick off a lot faster. Again. Uh, something you should have to do yourself, but uh, that's just one of the things that uh, I found. I found, um, I guess, with on demand, it's just going to be too expensive at the sort of scale that you are running at, and probably you're going to potentially exceed some of the limits as well in terms of how far you can go, you can push with uh, on demand. Um, okay, so those are some really good uh, wish list items for AWS to improve. So that's everything I wanted to cover. Uh, before we go, is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners? Uh, any personal projects you want to share? Maybe uh, Lumigo is hiring, and how do people get in touch with you? Uh, so first of all, Lumigo is always hiring. Uh, we are always looking for passionate people to join our team and uh, be part of the industry leaders, uh, which is great. And uh, and in person, more personal view, uh, I believe the serverless is going to change the way developer uh, building system. And uh, it's, I can really see this is the future of uh, the, the development world. And uh, serv serverless brings great solution uh, to many of the architectural challenges I had before. And it's a real refresh from traditional development stacks. So I really encourage everyone to to not even even if you're just starting, uh, even if you do a mini project, uh, try to play with it. it, it it's a blow mine, um, and uh, th that's what, that's what I I think about. Uh, but but one thing you should know when when you start using serverless, that you uh, you have to come with an open mind because it changes a lot of your conceptions. So so you need to think uh, differently when you're using serverless. But you you have to try to to understand it. Uh, so I really encourage everyone to, to try it. And how do people find you on the internet? Uh, maybe are you on Twitter, LinkedIn? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, email me. Uh, it's Uri uh, Uri uh, Lumigo .io, and uh, you can find me in all those three uh, uh, sectors. And um, just me whatever you want you can ask any question about serverless uh, and we will be happy to help everybody in Lumigos uh, we are, really want to uh, contribute to the to the community back 
for the serverless community back. Yeah, I've been working with Lumigo for a while now as a developer advocate uh, you know, for a couple of days a week. And I have to say the guys are really friendly and I love interacting with uh, Aries and uh, Aviad and Effie and everybody. So uh, it's, re it's a really good team, a good bunch, and they are doing quite a lot of work uh, around the community, uh, including all the stuff that they asked me to do in terms of open source and all that as well. Um, so it's been great having you on the show, Uri. Uh, take care and uh, stay safe. I hope uh, the lockdown has not, you know, hasn't been quite as extensive uh, over in Israel as it's been here. <laughs> and Israel is, I think, a bit better. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are all hoping to just uh, be finished and get over with it and get along with our life and do several stuff. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, hopefully that happens. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, and Bye-bye. That's it for another episode of Real World Serverless. To access the show notes and the transcript, please go to realworldserverless.com and I'll see you guys next time.